Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor support, and we know you'd rather we get right to talking about beekeeping. However, our great sponsors are critical to help making all of this happen. From the transcripts, the hosting fees, the software, the hardware, the microphones, the subscriptions, the recorders, they enable each episode. So with that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're really happy you're here. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to subscribe or follow Beekeeping Today podcast and give us a five-star rating. It really does help. Also, we are now adding complete transcripts of each episode on the website after the show notes. Check them out. You can also leave questions and comments online under each show. You can leave a comment, ask a question, reply to a question, ours or our listeners. Click on leave a comment at the top of the episode's show notes to join the discussion. Have you listened to an episode and thought, that person sounds really interesting? and I'd like to know more about them. Well, now you can. Each episode links to a guest profile. Each profile has a guest photo, bio, contact information, including Instagram and Twitter details if they have them. Check it out. And finally, share the podcast with your beekeeping friends, email them links, or mention it at your next beekeeper meeting. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. I hope your spring is going well, no matter where you are. Kim is joining us in just a few. We have a big episode set for you today. Later on, we have Dr. Frank Rikovich and Dr. Michael Simone talking about their work on the USDA ARS line of poline honeybees. It's bred with the varroa sensitivity hygiene, or VSH, as well as in testing its viability as a honeybee for commercial beekeeping. It's a fascinating, fascinating discussion you will want to hear. Recently, I met up with Dr. Dewey Karen at a local beekeeper meeting and was able to talk to him briefly about his Pacific Northwest honeybee survey. We'll hear about that in just a few minutes. But first, Kim is joining us with a review of Beekeeping at Buckfest Abbey, an old book by Brother Adam. Let's get to that right now. Hi, this is Kim Flottam again with another session of Bee Books Old and New, kindly sponsored by Northern Bee Books, publishers of hundreds of books on bees and beekeeping. Plus, they have available a huge collection of used and antiquarian beekeeping books. Check them out at www.northernbeebooks.co.uk. You've probably heard of Brother Adam, a monk who lived in Buckfast Abbey in the very south-central section of the UK, located very close to the southern coast of the island, and heading west towards Land's End. He was introduced to bees and beekeeping when he took residence at the Abbey, and was taught much of the craft by the Abbey's resident beekeeper brother, Columban, who had been in charge of the bees since 1895. In 1915, Brother Adam was appointed to assist Brother Columban. As it turns out, the timing was either terrible or extremely fortunate, depending on your perspective. The Isle of Wight disease was at its height throughout all of England, and all predictions in the fall of that year were that there would be no bees left in the country come spring. For background, the disease had been discovered, though the cause was not yet identified, on the Isle of Wight, a small island just off the coast of south-central England, very close to the Abbey. It spread to much of the UK fairly rapidly because of unrestricted bee movement and was rapidly causing the collapse of beekeeping in the country. It was this event in the UK that led the USDA to forbid the import of any honeybee from anywhere in the world to avoid unknown diseases and pests from coming here. It worked for a while, I guess. But the winter of 1915-16, though difficult, did not see the end of beekeeping. 
at least at the Abbey, as 16 of the Abbey's 46 colonies survived. However, those that perished were all native black bees. Not native in the sense they were originated in the UK, but were the dominant strain in the use there for many years. While those that did not perish were all of fairly recently imported Italian origin. This fact was not lost by the resident beekeeper. That summer, using the Italian stock, they made good their losses, and the next year increased numbers to a 100 colonies. Finally, in 1919, Brother Columban retired, and Brother Adam was put in charge of the Abbey's bees. It must be noted that the focus of this book is not nearly so much about the whys of the management techniques described, but simply the whens and the hows of their management. The reason the Abbey had bees was to achieve maximum yields of honey per colony, entailing a minimum of effort and time. As Brother Adam states in the preface, when all is said and done, success in beekeeping is, in its final analysis, determined by our ability to ensure that every colony is at all times in the best condition to make the most of a honey flow when one comes along. This book has three sections. Part 1 deals with general observations, looking at the bees used by Brother Adam, the hive, and the apiary, and the reasons for keeping bees. He sums this up nicely. He needed a bee that was able to withstand the demands of modern beekeeping, a hive of sufficient size to allow a colony to gather as much honey as possible, and a beekeeper smart enough to keep out of the way of his bees. Section 2 is simply seasonal management, in great detail, but simply what he did in each season and what tools and equipment he used to accomplish what needed done. If you are rather new at bees, these sections are fundamental, and you will gain insight into good seasonal seasonal management. However, the last section is on breeding, the skills Brother Adam is best known for. He carefully explains the need to is- of isolation of breeding colonies, the production of drones needed to ensure nearly pure crosses, and much of the rest of what is needed to raise good queens with desirable traits. But it is his enumeration and detail of these traits that should be noted here especially. These include fecundity, or how many eggs can a queen lay. Industry is simply how much of what kind of work will workers do. Disease-resistant absolutely must be on this list, but care must be taken so resistance to the appropriate diseases are chosen. A disinclination to swarm is indispensable, along with longevity, which both the bee and the beekeeper play a hand. Wing power means how far will workers fly for food, coupled with a keen sense of smell. Defense is important, but our experience here with African bees may have some role here. Winter hardiness, for those of us with winter, is important, but no less important is spring buildup. Some colonies are thrifty, that is, resource conservative, while some are not, which also covers self-provisioning, or how much will they store for winter. Comb building, both speed and skill, is critical, as is pollen collection. Less important to Brother Adam, but important enough for him to mention, we're having a good temper, meaning calm on the combs, little pro- propolis collection, and little brace comb construction. But attractive cappings, white better than wet, are needed, and a keen sense of orientation is needed for those foragers who travel further than most. All of these traits, we'll note, are good for the beekeeper first, and perhaps good for the bee in the long run, and that's only a perhaps. The value of this book lies not so much in what strains of bees to use to accomplish this art, but importing bees is essentially impossible, but rather gaining the full understanding of what traits are needed by beekeepers to develop a strain of bee needed where you are. One other thing Brother Adam mentioned was to never forget that the bee is in charge of this, not the beekeeper. We far too often forget that important point, but one wonders if that is completely correct. This book book is published and available from Northern Bee Books and is available on Amazon. That's it for today, folks. We'll talk to you next time. All right. This is Jeff. I'm in the Olympia Beekeepers Association meeting. And who do I run into today? Is Dr. Dewey Karen. Dewey, I'm glad to see you, actually, and not on Zoom. Thank you, Jeff. It's, uh, this is, uh, I think, the first live meeting of this group. That's exciting. I like that. It- it's the first time in a long time, it's, but it's, it's, it's good to actually see people around. So what brings you up to Olympia? So I was doing a bunch of talks uh, uh, coming north, so I had arranged to have uh, one trip to get meetings in uh, several different of the, the club groups. Um, this group lost their meeting, so I ended up having to, re- to come back to the, just to do this meeting tonight. So I'm up and down, up and back, and a real quick trip. 
Well, that's really generous of you, especially considering the price of fuel in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, indeed. And the fact that we're in one of our still our, our wet, rainy seasons after traveling the rain. Absolutely. Hey, you know, and, and it's great. I really enjoyed talking with you because I'm always whining, as our listeners know, about the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Northwest honeybee keeping and how difficult it is for me to get used to from coming from Ohio and Colorado. And, 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 and tonight's, you talked about your Pacific Northwest bee survey that you've been doing and you compare the management practices of so many bee, or so many beekeepers in the area. That's really fascinating. How long have you been doing that? So I had started doing survey work in the east as we have mites. One of the issues is, is what are people doing? It's a way for um, surveys are one way to look over your beekeeper's neighboring fence. So when I moved from the University of Delaware with retirement to live in a Portland area, I started doing a survey here. So I'm now in my 13th year of this survey. Uh, I'm looking at both the backyarder beekeepers, so individuals that have fewer or 50 or fewer colonies, as well as in a different survey at the larger scale, the commercial beekeepers. And so what it, then I do with the information is not only how, what level of loss do we, are we experiencing by our types of hives, by our hive uh, origination, whether it's an overwintered colony or a new colony we started, but I'm also looking at the man, some, several, some key managements and, and if you do some sort of a management, you feed them, let's say, a dry sugar, uh, what kind of level of survival do you have? So I compare the individuals that do feed, let's say, a dry sugar. I split it by fondant or dry vert or sugar candy and their level of loss. And then I'm comparing it to the overall level of loss. So it's a pretty conservative uh, look at in terms of can some of these managements make a difference in overwintering? And indeed, we find that a number of them do make a difference. And, and, and it's not necessarily just what's going to work this year. So now I have a good database. So I'm actually looking at the past several years. So, so I'll say that, uh, and let's say of a sh- using a sugar candy over winter in the last seven of eight winters, that made a difference in individuals doing that management, having a better survival. In other words, a lower loss rate. Well, that's really fascinating. And, and, and this is all available on your website. What's that website? So this is available on pnwhoneybeesurvey.com. You can take the survey there uh, or, or then look at these past results. For clubs such as the club here that has a return of, of roughly 20 or more surveys, I generate an individual club report. So it's immediately looking over the, the uh, uh, beekeeping fence of your immediate neighbors here in this club, plus those in, the, in Pierce County and in Lewis County, the immediate counties close by here, as well as your other Washington uh, beekeepers uh, that are included in the survey and Oregon survey uh, uh, backyarders as well. Well, that's really cool, and it's it's great to have that as a beekeeper. It's great to have that information readily available. It helps me manage my bees to see what other beekeepers in the area are doing that works in this location. As they say, beekeeping is all local, so that's that's really it great local. work. It is local, and it is timing. And, and you might know one or two other beekeepers, but this is giving you a look at another 20 people in your immediate area that are doing this or not doing this and how what kind of level of success they had. And what else are you working on? Um, so um, I am the uh, overall representative for the whole region for the organization called WAS, Western Apiculture Society. Um, we have not yet gone back to our live annual meeting, so we are having monthly uh, meetings of a, a mini-conference. We're featuring two speakers, uh, sometimes on the same topic or related, sometimes not. Um, so this month, uh, myself and a, um, a beekeeper uh, who has an interesting project in British Columbia are looking at bees in cities and urban areas. Um, it's come on very strongly, and there are companies that are selling corporations the idea of saving the bee, doing something of benefit for the environment, uh, educating their own employees about the about pollination and, and the importance of, of working and to help save bees by by having colonies of bees be on rooftops of their their city buildings or their campuses uh, where they where they're doing their their research or their development work or their or their headquarters. Well, what is happening is we're finding then we're getting an awful lot of bees in the urban area. 
And so we'd like to get a dialogue going in terms of, of how, how, what are the, the necessary supports that need to be in place where we're moving from bees in an agricultural area to having as many located in urban areas. Wow, that's, that's really good work. And you've been doing that for uh, this year? You started this year or have you been doing it for a couple of years? So I've been doing some of the tracking for a couple of years. We have some of, some of our associations that have more members in a city. We also ask the location, so we're, we're actually doing some mapping, and so we're, we're separating out um, our, from our database with the PNW Honeybee Survey those that are in urban settings versus those that are in more rural areas. And, and um, those in urban settings are not doing as well as those in more urban settings as a, as a general rule. Um, there, of course, are some exceptions, but it, it does appear like we are overloading the uh, carrying capacity for the cities and the, and the uh, and resources that are available for the bees by bringing in so many bee colonies, whether it's uh, for corporations or individuals that are just, you know, what I talked about tonight was colony creep, where you start with a couple of colonies, but all of a sudden with divides and capturing swarms, you end up with really more colonies. Your numbers of colonies have creeped upward more colonies than you care to take care of or really wanted to ever do. More of a challenge, on, especially on rooftops. And especially on rooftops, yeah. Present yeah. a whole new challenge for, for getting your equipment there, getting the honey back down off that roof, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, there's entertaining stories about beehives and elevators and, uh, and the looks people get. So, Dewey, I know you need to get back down the road, I-5, and it's getting dark, so I'll let you go. I look forward to having you back on the podcast here soon and talk with Kim as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'm, I'm a faithful listener for the podcast. You always have uh, uh, some of the, the, the very, very good guests, very interesting guests on. And it's always an interesting topic, so it's, it's, it's time well worth spent. And, and uh, appreciate the effort that you and Kim had, are doing to, to put out those regular podcasts. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate those kind words, and, and, and uh, I do agree. We have great guests, and it's especially fun when I get to see them face-to-face like I am right now. Thanks so much, and have a great trip home. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, beekeepers! Many times during the year, honeybees encounter scarcity of floral sources. As good beekeepers, we feed our bees artificial diets of protein and carbohydrates to keep them going during those stressful times. What is missing, though, are key components. The good microbes necessary for a bee to digest the food and convert it into metabolic energy. Only Super DFM Honeybee by strong microbials can provide the necessary microbes to optimally convert the artificial diet into energy necessary for improving longevity, reproduction, immunity, and much more. Super DFM Honeybee is an all-natural probiotic supplement for your honeybees. Find it at strongmicrobials.com or at fine bee supply stores everywhere. Thanks a lot, Strong Microbials. And right back to the show, sitting across the virtual Zoom table right now are Dr. Frank Rink, Rink, uh, Rinkovic. <laughs> Rinkovic. 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 Sorry. Oh, boy. I knew I was going to. We practiced this before we started recording, and I still messed it up. Sorry, folks. <laughs> and, and Dr. Mike Sim, Simone Finstrom. Did I get that right? So I, yep. I know NPR will never hire me now. Um, <laughs> welcome, guys, to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Well, Frank and Mike, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to meet you in person, such as it is. I have you know, know about your work. You are both scientists at the USDA Bee Lab in Baton Rouge, mm-hmm. and you have been working on something called the pole bee. And, or the pole line of bees, and I have not heard that phrase before this. Maybe it's because I wasn't paying attention, or you went up and changed the name on me. But tell us, tell us what your pole line of bees is. The, a little bit of the history, certainly, so people know where it came from, and then your recent research and the, some of the results. And I'm probably going to interrupt you and ask some questions during all of this. So I don't know which who who wants to start. <laughs> the Pauline bee is one that 
you know, you might not have heard before because the more common iteration or version of it had been VSH. So these are uh, mostly VSH, which means varroa sensitive hygiene. So these are bees that have been bred for the specific trait where they remove um, varroa parasitized brood. Uh, and this is a selection that's been going on at the Baton Rouge lab uh, well before uh, either Frank and I started at the lab. So there's a strong history of, of that breeding program at the lab. Uh, and then uh, the iteration that got it to Paul line uh, was led by Bob Danka, who's now retired, but involved with this project that we're talking about. And uh, what they did as part of that effort is they bred or outcrossed uh, these BSH bees into several different commercial uh, operations to make sure that the bees that are expressing this BSH, uh, this varroa resistance trait um, at a high level, that they can also be productive colonies in commercial operations. And so the Paul line is really bees that are well suited for pollination services. So that's sort of where that name came from. Uh, and then after that happened, and that there was one large paper of, of the production of, of those Pauline bees, we brought them back to the USDA lab in Baton Rouge and really further refined that breeding. And so then this recent study that came out is really the first big test of that, that really well-developed line expressing both this varroa sensitive hygiene trait at a at a really high level uh, and consistent level, uh, along with um, these other productivity traits that beekeepers are interested in, and really that's what the industry needs. So, does it make honey and stay alive? Basically, is where what it comes down to. It sounds like your your study. Um, you've brought in commercial beekeepers and and a significant number of colonies. I don't see the numbers, but uh, if you're working with commercial beekeepers, I bet you it isn't two out in the backyard. How how many were involved in 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 these in these experiments? About, I think we started with close to four hundred. Is that wow. about correct, Mike? Yeah, between the two years, um, it was yeah. I think um, yeah, it was a hundred and it was at least hundred and fifty per year, or a little bit upwards of that, um, and so. Um, yeah, so this is a large scale, but, you know, from, in terms of the commercial beekeepers, it's still a small number, but we were really going with these sample sizes that were going to be relevant to the beekeeping industry. So we filled up, um, four different apiaries in this commercial operation. Um, and then they traveled, um, through the circuit to, to really, um, give them a real test of what's happening in the real world. Uh, we like to, we partner as much as we can with commercial beekeepers in particular, because um, if what we're doing doesn't work for them, we're not doing, you know, fully what we need to do for the industry. Well, that um, also I wasn't aware of. It says that you overwintered uh, these bees in Mississippi, California, North and South Dakota, certainly uh, large honey producing states. Um, but what I was, what I also wasn't aware of, is that these were actual real, real world working bees. You put them on trucks and you pollinated them and and you split them and the, you know all of the things that commercial beekeepers do. And you started them in the spring, went the whole season. Yeah. So basically, we made splits with the beekeepers. So we use the splits from the beekeepers so that everything was being done exactly as they would do. We naturally made it our queens in a in an area with our drones. So again, similar to what the beekeepers do with uh, and what the beekeeper we worked with, he made it his queens in his standard way. We made it them naturally in a drone saturation area so that they were mating with our Pauline drones. Then we put all the the splits in the same spot. He loaded them up, and they their team loaded them up on the truck and brought them to the Dakotas and then disperse them in the apiaries um, until October. 
And then in October, they moved to California to the holding yards. There was a subset that just went back to Mississippi and stayed there as kind of a control for once it didn't go to California. Um, then they pollinated almonds after making honey all summer. And then they, they made it back to Mississippi uh, to be, you know, splits for the new year. Well, real world beekeeping. And and the results then re, are going to reflect what a commercial beekeeper could probably expect doing whatever it is he does during the course of a year. So uh, that, that would add, from my perspective, a lot of I'd have a lot more. I, I do have a lot more confidence in in uh, the results of this study because you made them work. Absolutely. And, yeah, that's good. As I was gonna say, because as scientists, because we like to be in control and have every account, uh, every factor accounted for. But in commercial beekeeping, sometimes things are out of your control, and you have to just roll with it. And that's why we use these big sample sizes. As we all know, beekeeping can be unpredictable at times. <laughs> so, a lot of colonies make it onto the, into the study, and then uh, just keep track of them. That's kind of a challenge, and it takes us a lot of places. So, working with people. Like I said, in the Dakotas where honey is being made, in California where almonds are being pollinated. So, yeah, the the relevance is very high to the commercial beekeeping industry for sure. I bet you guys spend a lot of time biting your tongues, right? Saying, don't do it that way because, because. <laughs> and they went ahead and did it that way anyway because that's what they do. And, and uh, I mean, yes, yes and no. I mean, really, this test was do these bees work with what? you know, with what beekeepers are doing, right? And so we want them to to treat them, you know, as they're going to, um, you know, to a degree. Obviously, it's like, and, and, and the ones, the beekeepers that we work with are really great about, you know, understanding that balance of, well, this is science, and so we need some more data. So unfortunately for them, they have to leave colonies that they would normally combine you know, in the holding yards in California, they would combine them before almonds or even after almonds, but so they're not combining them. And so then they have somewhat weaker stuff. Um, you know, some of the stragglers might still be persistent when they would have removed them, right? So they work with us and we work with them and we know, um, and we know that we're confident in the data that we're getting back is, is really applicable to what's going on. I want to go jump back to the beginning real quick because I'm just intrigued by the name, the Pauline. And and Michael, you had mentioned something that it was they were an, originally developed specific or with pollination directly in mind, or was it you know pollination first, honey second? It, was there a preference in the selection? So unfortunately. We, you know, we weren't part of the naming process, right? So okay. I think um, <laughs> some of the naming process came and I believe it was even um, one of the suggestions of one of the beekeepers that was working with um, with this line when they were sort of developing with the, the combining the bees from here with their bees. And one of the suggestions was um, to make the name um, so it's not necessarily pollination, or okay. but it's the idea that they will work for pollination services, right? So right. that pollination services is what's driving the industry, not necessarily honey production, right? So right, right. they need to produce honey and they need to be effective for pollination services, whether that's going up and down the East Coast or to California and almonds. So that's where that name came from, that it's for pollination services and really that means that they're going to be big in early spring uh, and be productive strong bees and that's ultimately what that name means it would have been confusing to call them worker bees because that, <laughs> <Right>. that name is <laughs> taken <laughs> well that's really that's really fascinating so kim had asked earlier and i don't maybe i missed the answer uh what was the original stock for these you you se selected for the VSH, but were they more the, the Carniolan or were they more Italian, more? Uh... Yeah, so the Pauline, B, the original VSH population uh, was largely derived from Italian bees. So, okay. um, so that's sort of the base population. And then, um, you know, certainly um, there's some mixture in there, but 
the pauline then had been bred mostly just with insemination so within the population so then it kind of closed the population again especially after they were in the commercial operations and then brought back but it's largely an italian based stock you know however it's that's one of the things that i think is important to express about um this these pauline bees and really when we're talking about these mite resistant traits is that you know there's varroa sensitive hygiene is expressed in carniolan bees italian bees russian bees and that's something that um that a number of beekeepers and queen breeders um you know are selecting for these sort of varroa resistant traits and so it really doesn't matter uh, if they're italian or not uh, from that perspective okay Let's take this opportunity to hear from our great friends at Better Bee. Hey, podcast listeners. If you've got a couple years of beekeeping under your belt and you're looking for a new challenge, available from Better Bee is the Hog Half Comb System, a mess-free comb honey system that you put on a strong hive for your bees to fill. Made of 32 to 40 individual food-grade recyclable cassettes, it only takes popping off the covers and sticking on your labels to get your half combs ready for sale. Visit betterbee.com forward slash H-O-G-G today to learn more and start making your own mess-free comb honey. Part of this experiment was to treat some of these bees and to not treat some of these bees. And you had um, uh, uh, some spectacular results. I think the the bees that you treated. What was what was the treatment? So the treatment went on in the fall after after honey gets pulled off. They really need to treat for for varroa because up till that time when those boxes of honey come off, that's the longest time the varroa has been able to develop with in the absence of a mitocyte treatment. So the beekeeper that we work with, they're treating right after that event occurs, and this is this treatment goes on. And that's usually what they do for the fall treatment. And then in the winter time, they'll do another treatment as well. And so in that process for our experiment, we had a design to set up to see, does Pauline need that fall treatment in order to have very low Varroa? So in some of the colonies, we skip that fall treatment. And when I say fall, I mean late August um, when they pull honey. Some of them got that treatment and some of them didn't get the treatment. But then they all got treated in the winter time when they went to uh, either California or Mississippi for holding. So we have a high treatment and a low treatment. The high ones got both the fall and winter, and the low treatment only got the winter treatment. And in that case, the commercial stock that got the low treatment only the skip the fall, only winter, they had really poor performance. I think that the final total was under 10% survival, if I got that correct, Mike. Yeah, it was between... Yeah, 10 and 20% survival for sure. But when Pauline didn't only had the low treatment, they skipped that fall treatment, survivorship was over 50%. So a very big difference in the commercial versus Pauline treatments. But when they got when both stocks got the high treatments, fall and winter, they performed kind of similarly. Pauline had a little bit higher survivorship, but the commercial really needed that fall treatment in order to have high survivorship around 50%. So it just shows that Pauline can perform pretty well without that Paul that fall treatment. The fall treatment definitely helps, but it doesn't have that dramatic effect like it does in unselected stocks. And that was kind of what we we almost kind of expected that because when we work with the, these bees at the lab, we know that they could maintain very low row levels without any kind of miticide treatment. So to see that uh, without any miticides in the field, they still performed quite quite admirably that was very good to get that data for sure the treatment whether either one or two treatments uh the the product applied to these bees was the choice of the commercial beekeeper or you did that so did you were were all of the treatments using the same product or were there different products being used yeah so it was all the same product all the colonies um a lot of commercial beekeepers like to be, treat all their colonies the same. So that was actually really good for the for part of the experimental design, but that they all got treated the same in terms of miticide application. So yeah, same product, same timing, all that stuff was kind of very consistent across the treatments. Would you recommend this product to other beekeepers to use? And can I ask you the name just so folks have an idea? 
So amateurized based products are what most beekeepers are using. And so we actually study amateurized resistance in Vero because a lot of beekeepers that rely on amateurized as the, the miticide of choice, um, if you only are using that to control Varroa, it tends to lead to higher treatment rates. And uh, because if a little bit works, maybe a little bit works even better. <laughs> and so what we've been finding out is that these Varroa are being selected for resistance. And that's a whole other <laughs> aspect of my research that we're, we're, we're working on. So what's really interesting about this VSH behavior and these Pauline bees is that we could hopefully reduce some of our reliance on these miticides to really mitigate the development of resistance. Uh, if we could get away with that one less fall treatment, perhaps, um, it's really good for developing, delaying the onset of the potential of resistance. Uh, the other thing is that if you maybe miss a treatment or you forget to treat an apiary in a certain bit of time, this VSH behavior kind of acts as a little bit of redundancy in your Varroa treatment program. So I think that going forward that there should be a, uh, I mean, I think that it also helps to build a more robust, resilient Varroa management program by incorporating these bees with VSH behavior for sure. Well, the, the, like I said before, the, the states that the bees that you were working with were from Mississippi, California, North and South Dakota. Did you see a location difference? I mean, I, I know winters in Mississippi are significantly different than winters in North Dakota. Um, and, and I'll just throw a tail end on there. Were any of these beekeepers wintering their bees uh, inside? So location and location, I guess. <laughs> sure. So one of the things that we did, uh, look at in terms of the Mississippi perspective. So um, they, all of the bees went to the Dakotas and that was really just for honey production. Then uh, a large portion of them went to California. And so then they, they stayed there for, for the winter. So they didn't, um, when it started snowing, they get out of the Dakotas, right? And then they go and sit in California. The other subset went to Mississippi um, and those um, stationary ones, or we had another set that, yeah, that really just stayed in in Mississippi, and that was the biggest location difference. Uh, and that was because, in all honesty, there wasn't the management that they were getting in in the Dakotas, and so they ran out of food because there isn't there wasn't great food for them in the summer in Mississippi, which is one of the reasons why they leave, right? And so the biggest location difference was that when you're not properly managing colonies, they can starve because they don't have enough resources uh, in certain places and, you know, particularly in the South. We had, and when I was in North Carolina, we often had to feed colonies in, uh, in August too, uh, because if they're not getting the resources because it's not a good location. And that's one reason why we have to move these out, right? So we don't really have, I wouldn't say, great sort of locational evidence in terms of overwintering from, from this particular experience. Um, but we have worked, you know, and collaborated with others that are working with these Pauline bees around the country. And, um, and they overwinter just as well um, in the Midwest as they do uh, here in Louisiana, which is really nice to see. Well, it's even even more real world um, in this in this uh, experiment. And and did, were any of these people wintering indoors? Oh, sorry, um, no, we didn't do. So this was all done with one commercial beekeeper in this particular case, and so um, we haven't done um, any um, any indoor overwintering here. Okay, all right. Well, I'm just curious about that. Well, that's actually interesting you bring that up because we're I'm working on this grant with a bunch of other people from across the country to do this sort of holistic Varroa control program. And so one of them is to use different stocks of bees in these overwintering facilities, like you're, you're mentioning, to see if there's any sort of stock interactions with this overwintering. Because there's this idea that some bees are adapted to their local environment and selective uh, how they're brought up. And so we want to check to make sure that these Pauline bees or the one that we run here um, can survive in these cold overwinter climates just because, you know, Louisiana it doesn't get too cold here even in the winter, but we want to see how they perform in those cold overwintered sort of environments because I know that a lot of people are interested in the benefits that 
a, an overwinter indoor storage can have on their bees. So we want to make sure that these bees are uh, performing well under all conditions. So the more that we could study it, the more that we could see if they're applicable across the board. The other half of the Varroa problem, of course, are the viruses. And I know you looked at, what was, I want to say, the three major viruses that, that you were looking at. And did you see, I guess the, the, the question would be between treated and non-treated and then treated once um, and, and, and not treated. Did you see three piles of dead bees or, or not? Uh, three different size piles of dead bees from virus from the from this. Yeah, sure. Most of the virus difference that we see is really between um, a sort of unselected stock and the mite resistant stock. We see that um, you tend to have less viruses in pauline bees, um, and in large part, you know, the viruses do correspond to mite levels, right? So. Um, when you have less mites reproducing and feeding on offspring, that generally tends to uh, reduce um, the viruses overall in the whole population, um, particularly with deformed wing virus. Um, and uh, in this case, chronic bee paralysis virus 2, which has sort of a mild association with varroa. Interestingly, we didn't find a difference in the amount of black queen cell virus uh, between the two populations. And, uh, and that's one that's not transmitted by Varroa. Um, so there's something else going on there, but we definitely see pretty clear um, differences in deformed wing virus, which uh, we've seen now several times um, with sort of VSH bees, but a lot with the, the Russian bees too, they tend to carry less deformed wing virus and, and we think that's also in part because of keeping the varroa in check. Um, so there's definitely a good thing if you're keeping the mites in check, you're keeping the viruses in check too. Well, that makes perfect sense. Who is, which one of you was the lucky person who got to do all those virus samples? <laughs> well, yeah, thankfully. So all that, all that virus work gets done in my lab, but um, Thomas O'Shea Weller, who is the, the postdoc who led all these analysis, um, he had the wonderful task of mashing up bunches of bees and, and doing all of the extractions and, and viral analysis. Well, one of the things I was interested in knowing is how sticky is the, the, Pauline, the Pauline in in a given group? How often would uh, a beekeeper need to requeen his operation to maintain that breed line? So the the, the genetics of VSH in Pauline uh, is quite tricky um, because this is a complicated behavior where they have to first detect these infested cells, then uncap it, remove it. So it's a stereotypical uh, behaviors that they have to be coordinated. So there's probably a lot of genes involved. Exactly how many, we're not too sure, but we have some ideas. But what's interesting is that since it's such a polygenic trait covered by many different genes, it seems like after you cross one of these highly selected queens with a non-selected drone, the offspring tend to have some sort of level of VSH behavior. But when those daughters then reproduce to make their granddaughters, mm -hmm. they tend to have very low levels of expression. So after about two rounds of outcrossing to non-VSH drones, they tend to dilute the, the behavior. And that's what's really tricky is uh, to maintain this in a population, we have to create this kind of genetic momentum. So that way when they are mating, they are outcrossed and mating to open drones, that those drones are also VSH so they can maintain it. And that's what's really tricky is we have to find out what level of penetrance in the population we have to get these genes so that way it kind of maintains itself yeah. without constant infusion of this genetic material. Yeah, whether that those traits, well, since it's multiple multiple genes expressing it, right? So mm -hmm. that wouldn't be be multiple recessive traits, I guess. And the good thing is, though, we demonstrate that we can do this because initially with this Pauline, it was maintained by instrumental insemination, so very highly controlled breeding. But the ones that we did for this experiment, we just let them open mate in drone aggregation areas. Like Mike said, we saturate it with Pauline drones. So if a breeder is working with this, they can uh, maintain this phenotype with open mating, which is actually a really big, important step to uh, uh, making this commercially va viable. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I don't know too many queen queen producers who are going to instrumentally inseminate every queen. It's just <laughs> it's a lot easier to open mate them for sure. Yeah, I think to me that was one of the most exciting things about these results because this was really that first um, big. This was the first time that we had really naturally mated pauline in this kind of drone saturation area. So um, that's a big step in towards moving this um, breed or stock forward. I think just. But the other thing is we really need to continue to work on tools for selection that beekeepers can use um, for these traits. And, and there's, um, you know, groups, you know, kind of led by Kara Wagner who's working on a chemical assay. Then there's a group in France that are working on different assays that can be used kind of like the freeze-killed brood assay for more general hygienic behavior um, that would then help um, everybody be able to assess this trait uh, and really increase it. And then that can lead to, you know, these genes being uh, more widespread. And we're also have other projects with other collaborators looking more specifically at these genes with the idea of being able to do marker assisted selection down the road. So these are all things that we're actively working on and we wish that we could give you these tools right now. Um, but they do. Yeah. They take a long time to develop. It kind of leads to my, the ultimate question that I'm sure our listeners are having is, is how, how soon can I order one from my local queen breeder and get them into my yard? Is, is that something that's going to happen or is this a, a exercise and intellectual exercise? Yeah, no, for sure. The um, USDA and our lab has had different partners over the years working, you know, to, to try and uh, work with, getting the VSHBs out, uh, you know, and that's mostly been focused on getting breeders out and, and those partners making breeders that they can then sell. I, again, we worry about that trait diluting over time or even in one generation, right? So, uh, and right now there's the uh, agreement that we have kind of for these Pauline bees or a Paul-like bee is with the Hilo bees out of Hawaii. Uh, and that's, the one of the that's the only agreement we have right now so it's the helo stock is as close to the paul line as any others um but there are other um bee breeders uh people that sell bee queens or honey bee queens that are producing um bees that are at least somewhat bsh or have resistance to varroa via bsh or other mechanisms and i think the important thing is if people are advertising varroa resistance in their bees or in those queens is to actually talk to them and say, okay, how are you selecting for it? Um, and do they, if they have sort of the data to back up that they're, um, that their bees are resistant to varroa, um, then that's who you want to go with, right? Mm -hmm. Just like if it's just like, any other thing that you buy, you want to know if the product that you're buying, um, if it's, you know, made in a certain way or whatever. And, and the same thing should be true for Queens. I think that um, we can be responsible sort of consumers and producers, right, for for getting the products that we want. Yeah, evaluating these colonies for row resistance is quite labor intensive. It's you have to inspect brood cells in each colony and then check for mite reproduction and things like that. So it's it's very involved just to evaluate each colony and to do this at the commercial scale. It does take a significant investment of time. But like Mike was saying, is that just knowing those criteria that beekeepers, oh, the producers are using would be really important. So like I said, selection, what criteria and you know things like that are critically important to making it viable because the trick with any this or any honeybee stock in general is to make sure it lives up to its claims right yeah is to you know if you say your bees make tons of honey well let's hope to make sure they make tons of honey and with vsh it's no different is that we want to if you're going to be selling them let's make sure that they are producing bees with very low varro populations well here's a quick question if i was if i was a queen producer selling queens to beekeepers anywhere and everywhere, both breeder stock and general um, uh, working stock queens. And I wanted to convince people that I was doing things right and that the bees, that they, the queens that they were going to be buying, 
met certain standards. Is there some way, could you put together something, or could a queen breeder put together a, 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 essentially a cheat sheet that said, okay, virus load this much, varroa load this much, overwintering this percent, you know, list the 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 things that beekeepers are interested in and and rate your bees to you know compare your bees to how those things uh the beekeepers are looking for do am i making any sense here i mean <laughs> you just said it right i want to know what you're producing and if if i'm buying a car i want to know it gets this many miles per gallon and <laughs> you know all of these things or this many miles per charge i guess maybe that's the new one <laughs> um but is there some way to do that? Yeah, I don't know. It's tr you know, ultimately it is tricky, right? And so it does. If you're going to say that you're measuring honey production, for example, right? You would have to good one, yes. Have some sort of standardized measure. Is it over a season? Is it in Louisiana where they're going to make a ton of honey? You know, in May and June. You know, and or is it two week weight gain? Right. I don't think we have great standards uh, in terms of some of those measures that then could be widespread across the board and not often environmentally dependent. Right. But I think in terms of sort of mite resistance, one of the things would be is your breeding population are they? you know, treated for mites. Like, is that part of your selection? If you're treating for mites in that population, then it's hard to assess, um, you know, mite population growth potentially, right? So like, are you looking at how the mites grow in those breeder colonies over a three month time period? That's a really good example of kind of an, an easier metric that could be done as long as colonies are, you know, kind of a similar size and make sure they're, you know, queen right. But if you're looking at that mite population growth over time, so your sugar shakes or alcohol washes um, every month or, um, and then is that number increasing, that can be one metric. Now, if you have low mite population growth, especially, you know, from that spring season and summer, you know, especially over winter, right? Does that mean you're selecting for varroa sensitive hygiene? No, it means you're selecting for low mite population growth from some mechanism, right? You don't know what that is. So I think it's more of like, if a breeder is saying that they are producing varroa sensitive hygienic bees, how are they measuring it to know that that's what it is? Mm -hmm. If they're selecting just mite resistant, you know, bees, what is that metric? So I don't think it necessarily has to be the same. And I don't think we need all necessarily, you know, VSHBs. I think we need bees that have a variety of um, traits uh, that they use to defend themselves against all of their various parasites and, and pathogens. Um, and I think that's what makes a healthy bee population. Yeah, as Mike was mentioning, there are many different ways to get low vro population. So the mite reproduction is one uh, way that they can enter, uh, keep pop keep vro populations low. Then another scientist at the lab found that there's this programmed death in the larvae in this one stock that also prevents mites from reproducing. It's called the term social apoptosis. It's <laughs> kind of what, it's a behavior that's seen in the original host of the varroa the Apis serrana, but this was one of the, the first demonstrations that yes, an Apis mellifera, they could also undergo this sort of programmed social apoptosis where they they self-sacrifice the larvae to uh, to prevent the varroa from reproducing. So a lot of different ways to get at it. And so it's either, so the, under the varro, low varroa population umbrella, there's many different ways to get to that endpoint. Well, I, I'm throwing the gauntlet down to the queen production industry to develop a, a standard, a, sta a set of standards that I can essentially put an ad in a magazine and say, these are my bees. I, I bet it can be done. I bet somebody somewhere can figure this out. And the other interesting thing is that some people have different definitions of what's acceptable to them. So our one beekeeper, they say that my definition of resistance is that I don't have to do two treatments for minus side applications. So to them, it's more of a functional sort of operational level of resistance where if he doesn't treat for varroa in the fall, 
he still gets good survivorship. So that's, he doesn't know how exactly that happens, that why he doesn't need it, whether it's VSH or the social apoptosis or what the mechanism is to him functionally, that's his definition of resistance. It's the end result that counts. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Well, what have we missed? You guys have done good work here. I'm, I'm excited about ha- being able to go down and get some mite resistant queens a uh, week after next when I have to requeen. Uh, <laughs> what have we missed other than other than what we've talked about about this this level of research? For for me, I think that this is really de- de- just demonstrating that uh, the importance of varroa in honeybee colony health. Uh, we clearly demonstrated with in in our study that these bees with VSH behavior that specifically remove varroa. That's made that's the major difference between this and the commercial stock. Uh, you know, all other things being equal, you know, same landscapes, same regulatory pathway, same management style, same potential pesticide exposure. So all that stuff is the same, but the major difference here is varroa. So I think that's what's really important. I think it also really underscores the need for diversifying our varroa management options. So we have VSH in Paul line. That's really good. You know, miticides when you don't have resistant varroa tend to work quite well. Um, but there's also things like cultural controls, like we mentioned, the the overwintering and then the management programs when, you know, the strategic splitting kind of things and all these, all these other ways. I think we need to think about Varroa management as a system as opposed to, oh, we're just going to use one thing. We're going to use miticides. We're going to use this one thing. Because once you only rely on one thing, the, the nature has a way of overcoming those uh, barriers. And they, like in the case of amateurs, they develop resistance. So I think building redundancy in the system makes a more robust Varroa management system. I think you said uh, something that uh, lots of times comes true. Nature, Mother Nature bats last. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think that's true. However, there you, you're beginning to show that there's a lot of ways to, uh, if not control that, at least make it manageable. And I like your I like your term management system for Varroa control. Varroa control management system. That's a, a good way to end this. Michael, do you have any closing thoughts? No, I mean I, I just I totally agree that oftentimes we think of we, there's a lot of talk of integrated pest management and learning how IPM works for honeybees and Oftentimes that just means rotating chemicals, right? And we often lose sight of the bee. And uh, we really should be promoting all of these great bee defenses that they have against their own um, their parasites. The bees can, can do it uh, if we let them and if we work with them to it. So we, we have to remember the bees there and at the heart of it all. Oh, that's excellent thought for closing. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been enlightening, and I look forward to being able to find some pole bees somewhere this summer. I'm kidding. Somewhere <laughs> soon. How's that? How's that? So stay warm down in Baton Rouge, and I hope we can talk again. Thanks. It was great. Thanks, Gabe. Yeah, thanks for having us. This is great. Thank you. Enjoyed talking with you and look forward to having you back. All right. Cheers. Absolutely. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at globalpatties.com. Thanks to Strong Microbials for their support of this podcast. Check out their probiotic line at strongmicrobials.com. We want to thank Better Bee for their longtime support. Check out all their great beekeeping supplies at betterbee.com. Thanks to Northern Bee Books for their support of Bee Books Old New with Kim Flodham. Check out all of their books at northernbeebooks.co.uk. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to leave us comments and questions at leave a comment section under each episode on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, everybody.